Hi guys and welcome back to the UK's human landscape. Today in lesson 12 we're talking about improving quality of life for people living in London. Now unlike our previous lessons where we're talking about things that have happened in the past, these things are very very recent or alternatively planned for the future. Now we're talking today about things that could change, that might be planned to change, that will improve people's quality of life say that phrase quality of life we can mean a variety of different things we can mean it on a social level do you have enough space do you have nice quality housing can you afford to live in that uh, in that housing and of course that links very closely to an economic quality of life do you have a reliable job do you, can you afford to live in the area that you're supposed to be living in and of course your environmental quality of life are you surrounded by green space is the air pollution or air quality good enough for you to have a positive quality of life so we're going to get started thinking about what it means to have a good quality of life and then we're going to move on to looking at ways in which london is trying to improve the quality of life for all londoners Let's start off then with a couple of problems that cities like London are likely to experience. We're looking for negative things here, but on the, on the basis that we are going to start to think about things that we could improve about London. So what problems do we start with that we might then want to improve? Have a little think, see if you can come up with three for me, please. You're struggling with that? Think about the area that you live in and what you would like to see changed to improve local people's lives. Okay, so a couple of ideas then from me. Traffic, uh, this is one of my pet peeves. Traffic can be absolutely horrendous and of course it causes all kinds of other problems as well as just being congestion. There's all the air pollution, there's the inefficiency of use of fossil fuels, uh, there's the fact that it's noisy and unpleasant to sit in and it wastes people's time, loads of things. Uh, housing shortages, that there isn't enough housing in the area or perhaps it's overpriced. High levels of pollution, whether that's litter or as I've already said, air pollution. A lack of green space. Perhaps if you live in a flat right now, you're noticing during lockdown that it's quite difficult not having a garden to sit in. Perhaps you feel like you live too close to other people. The areas are overcrowded. Maybe there's a lack of employment opportunities, inequality, poverty, rising prices, high levels of crime. Whatever it is, these are some of the issues a lot of cities face. So this is where we kind of start with, where we're talking about how are we going to improve the area that we live in. We're going to move on now to think about a manifesto. Now, the manifesto that I'm asking you to read is a sort of speech written by Sadiq Khan. And it was written when he was trying to become uh, the mayor of London in 2016. Now, he did actually win that election in 2016. And the bit that I'm asking you to read are sort of his promises for what he thinks would have made London better, what he said he wanted to do to make London better. And what I want you to do as you read through is to highlight it in three different colours. So you're going to highlight in pink, please, for social things. So things like housing, services, that includes education or healthcare. Economic things like transport and employment. Now, transport's a weird one because it could be, oh, in all kinds of places, it could be about people's maybe access to jobs, as I've put it here, but it could equally, to a certain extent, be part of the built environment. Okay, is it is it good transport? Um, but in this case, we're going to say transport is part of economic stuff because it helps businesses and it helps people get to their employment. But of course, you know, if we're talking about perhaps green transport schemes like cycle lanes, that might be something under environmental. So we might also be thinking about our green spaces and our energy um, and that kind of stuff. So just reading through and highlighting it, I'll show you what that looks like. So your worksheet looks like this. Here is the article that I want you to read. And you literally just need to highlight it. So if we have a little look, uh, for example, he's talking about here, 
Londoners are being priced out of the city. And so I would, I would highlight that. I'd say, well, that's an economic thing. So let's highlight that in blue. And then housing is unaffordable and home ownership a distant dream. I might highlight that one in pink because as we've said, housing and services is going to be in pink. Okay, so that's how I want you to do this task, please. Pause the video, off you go. Okay, so you should have found quite a few different examples in there. Perhaps you've seen the bit about making affordable homes. That's a huge social thing. And we've actually talked a little bit in previous lessons when we were talking about regeneration, how many of those homes that were built were actually affordable? We're going to come back to that again today. Uh, he's talking also about being a pro-business mayor, okay? Trying to create opportunities for entrepreneurship and that kind of stuff. And, and that's a very much an economic part of how he wants to improve people's lives. He thinks that boosting entrepreneurship and businesses is going to improve the types of jobs that people have the opportunities to do. And that should improve people's lives because hopefully that's going to lead to higher incomes. Towards the end, he's talking about things like tackling air pollution and ways in which we can do that. Now, as we already said, this was something from 2016. And so we're going to look today a couple of examples of things that have actually happened. So sometimes when we're talking about a plan or a project, we're asked to assess or judge whether or not it was a good idea, whether or not we think it will have the effects that we want it to have. And so we do want to have a little think about how do we do that? Because today I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and we've already looked at a few um, strategies for improving the city. But if you want to compare them, how do you compare them if they're not all the same thing? OK, so there are quite a lot of problems that London and other UK cities face and loads and loads of ideas for improving them. If we're trying to decide if an idea is right or good and we want to judge and assess these strategies, we're going to think about it in the sense of whether it is sustainable. Now, the United Nations defines sustainable as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this is a fantastic definition. It's one I would love you all to learn. But it doesn't break down into different areas that we can then write about in an eight mark question. So let's have a think about two different ways we could break this down. How can we say it meets the needs of people today? without impacting negatively on the future. So the first way is something that I hope you feel quite confident and familiar with. We've already done a bit of this today. Thinking about it in an economic, environmental and social perspective, when you have the combination of it being good for society, good for the environment and good for the economy, and where all of those things meet together, that would be considered sustainable development. So let's say, for example, uh, we're talking about a project that's going to suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now, that may be fantastic for the environment and it may be great for people living there with a higher air quality and, you know, it may create loads of jobs. But the problem is that it's really, really, really expensive. Well, if it doesn't have the economic side of things, it may not be as sustainable as we would hope. The obvious counter to this is, say, something like traditional oil extraction. Fantastic for the economy. It keeps machines and energy coming. It helps people get to work. It helps people get the goods from around the world, improves international trade, it improves our quality of life because we can have light and internet and, you know, hot water and everything else. But it is devastating for the environment. And so, of course, we know that classic oil consumption is not sustainable because it has economic, it has a social, but it doesn't have the environment in mind. OK, so when we're balancing these schemes up or these plans up, are we saying, OK, it's affordable, it's a good idea for the economy, it's good for the environment and it's good for people, then it's a great idea. Okay, this is something that is actually sustainable and we can support it. 
Now, if this feels to you like something we do too much and you want an alternative, here is one, okay? This model is a quadrant model, okay? And it's not too different from what we've talked about in the past, but what it does is it gives you four questions. And these four questions, if the answer to each of these four questions is yes, then it is a sustainable plan or a sustainable project, okay? So our first one, is equality. Does it benefit everyone? Yeah, and that links a bit to the social stuff. It might also link to the economic stuff. So it kind of has a bit of overlap here. The future stuff, will it last? Something like fossil fuels, as we know, non-renewable energy, it's not going to last. It's not a good plan for hundreds and hundreds of years into the future. The fourth one, public participation. Is it bottom up? Is this something that somebody dreamed up in the halls of Westminster and is forcing everyone else to do that they don't really want to do and don't think is a good idea, doesn't suit their lives? Or is this something that as a community, everyone's like, yes, this is the right thing to do? Okay. And then the last one, the environment. Is it eco-friendly? Because if we destroy the environment, then it cannot possibly be good for the future. If we destroy the environment, how can that help us to be sustainable? Um, so those four aspects, yes, there's some overlap, but maybe that's a better way for you. You're saying, does it have benefits for everyone? Yes or no? Okay. If it creates inequality, then it may not be considered sustainable. Will it last? Well, if it can't keep going, if you have to keep putting more money and money, money into it, and you, you know, it can't get it to go by itself, then maybe it won't last. So having considered these two models, we're now going to look at one planned change for the future of London. And these next two tasks are both videos where I want you to answer questions about them. If you are following the PowerPoint, you can click the video in here. If you're using the worksheet, then you can click the video link in the worksheet. I've left the questions here on the left hand side just so that you can check what it is that you're looking to answer as you go, as you watch the video. But you literally just click like this and it should play directly inside your PowerPoint. So when you watch this video, I'd like you to please watch from the beginning to about five minutes in. You're welcome to watch the whole thing, but obviously you don't have to if you don't have time or you're feeling a bit stressed. But like I always say, I quite like it if people watch the entire video. Uh, pause the video now, answer the questions and I'll see you in a moment. Okay, so some of the answers to these questions, or all the answers to these questions, I should say. How many buildings over 20 storeys, so that's 20 floors, are planned to be built in London? You should have got a number somewhere in the region of 400 odd. 436 tall buildings over 20 storeys are planned to be built in London. Okay, and this is quite controversial, as you have probably seen through this video. So one of the reasons it's controversial is because it talks about foreign investors using property as a safety deposit box. What do we mean when we say that? What, what are they talking about? All over the place we hear this. We hear the idea, actually, in fact, in that manifesto at the beginning, it said gold bar properties, as if you were just looking after a bar of gold, but it's in fact a flat, okay? And what we're saying here is that People buy the property and then just leave it empty. Like they'll buy a three bedroom flat that someone could live in and they buy it for a relatively low price and then they wait for 15 years while it stays empty. Nobody ever gets to live in it and then they sell it for a higher price later on, okay? And so although that might be good for the person who owns it, it is no good for the people who are actually living in the city, okay? What reason does the mayor's office give for allowing all of these new buildings? Well, this one is pretty obvious. They're basically saying, we need more homes. We need more housing. And one of the reasons that houses are so expensive is because we don't have enough of them. So a shortage of them means people pay higher and higher prices for it. It's like rare trading cards, okay? Commercial space is space for shops uh, and offices and things like that. How many more homes in London are needed each year then? So they've said that we need more homes. That's why we need to build more buildings, especially tall ones. Um, how many more? 
should have been somewhere around 50 thousand new homes every year are required in London and this is partly the result of what we talked about way earlier on in the unit about people wanting to come and live in London people migrate to our cities and that puts a lot of pressure on the housing market in those places so how are they increasing the density of people living inside London's boundaries if we're not going to let London get any bigger, because as we found out last lesson, that there's a green belt all the way around London that prevents the city growing at the edges, how do we increase the number of people without increasing the size outwards? We have to build upwards. On the space that might have contained four houses, if you build a tower block of flats, you might build 10 stories worth of four flats. And in doing so, on that same amount of land, instead of having four families, you could have 40 families. But not everyone agrees with these massive plans and a lot of architects don't like them. Why don't a lot of architects like the new buildings? One of the reasons we had, they sit, the designs don't match the city's history. And one of the words that was there that is a bit of an unusual one, but a great one to learn, is that the buildings are not aesthetically pleasing, i.e. they don't look nice, yeah? There's one particular example towards the end of the video uh, where we hear from a person called Piers Corbyn uh, who really, really objects to a, new, to a council estate that's being knocked down in Southwark and being replaced with a £1.5 billion scheme. Now, this is really, really close to the centre of town, so the land value is really high. What we mean when we say that is that the price of the land that people are living in right now is really valuable. They can sell it for loads and loads of money. So they're going to knock down the old housing estate. But Piers Corbyn thinks that the new housing that they build isn't going to be affordable because the land is now so expensive. Most people who live there right now are not going to be able to live there in the future when they build the new buildings. So he's saying it's forcing them out. And what that really amounts to is social cleansing of our poorest in the city, because it's saying you can only live here if you're wealthy. But other people are saying, no, there are loads of benefits to these plans. They're saying that if we didn't have investors, foreign direct investment, do you remember that phrase? I hope you do. If we didn't have investors paying for or funding these developments, we wouldn't be improving the areas as much as we want to. Yeah, what we're saying is that, for example, last lesson we talked about the Olympics and we said the Olympics forced the government to give loads of money to East, to East London to develop. Well, without foreign direct investment, most places wouldn't have that funds because the Olympics don't come around very often, do they? Finally then, which groups of people have we heard from? You could probably look back through our, our questions to find out this, but we have heard a little bit from architects, from residents, people that live there, protesters who are really objecting to it, and from the local government, the council, okay? Next video. This one's a bit shorter, I would say, and it's the example of a congestion charge. Now, you should already know that London has got a congestion charge in central London and it makes well I'm not going to tell you what it does because you're going to find that out in the video but this video is about Jack investigating whether or not the set the congestion charge as it is in London would suit Newcastle where he lives in the northeast now this process of investigating it is an interesting one because you're going to hear from loads of different people and of course I want you to answer those questions again on your worksheet like I said before you can pause my video and click this one in the PowerPoint, or you can pause my video and click the link in your worksheet. Off you go. Okay, let's have a look at some answers then. Why does Jack dislike traffic? For many of the same reasons that I do. Breathing in air pollution is absolutely terrible for our health, as well as being boring as anything. How does a congestion charge work? It basically makes people pay to bring their cars into the centre of the city or certain areas where you charge a congestion charge. So instead of making people, instead of letting people drive, you say, if you want to drive, you're going to pay extra. Or if you can take public transport, 
you won't have to pay. And that is supposed to encourage people not to drive in the center of the city. But not everyone agrees with it. Some people do, some people don't. So why do they say that the congestion charge might be a good idea for Heaton? That was the area of the city that he went with that air pollution meter to get a reading. Well, it was a busy, busy congested area. And in particular, they were talking about children's health affected in the local schools right on those busy roads. And this is something that we have a real problem with in London as well. But like we said, not many people like this idea and particularly local business owners don't like it because they feel that it's a tax on coming into town and it's gonna impact their costs by making their costs higher and reducing their profits. Okay, so you know when we're talking about social and economic, well, this plan seems like it's good for the environment, good for air pollution, good for social stuff, children's health, people's health, making the area less busy and congested, but is it economically sensible? Well, businesses don't agree that it is, but if you wanted the flip side of that, which he hasn't mentioned in this video, of course, any money that is raised from charging people to bring their cars into town could be spent on other things that improve people's lives. So maybe it is sensible. When they looked at the data on the air pollution monitor, from the air pollution monitors that they collected, what were the results that they got? So they found that there were high levels of air pollution across most of Newcastle and over a thousand people die from air pollution each year in the Northeast alone. So it's a major problem. It's not something that can't, you know, that could be ignored for perhaps. Finally, then he spoke to somebody from the local council and did they agree that a congestion charge was the right way to go? Well, actually they didn't. They said that they wouldn't want to punish people for driving into town by making them pay a fee, but they did want people to use way more public transport, changing their behaviors, and that would reduce the traffic and congestion and the air pollution without making people pay. Okay, so they kind of wanted a bit of compromise there, but they didn't rule it out entirely. They said if people can't change their ways, maybe we'll have to force them in this manner. So our final task today then. With this one, I want your opinions personally. So it's another reading task, sorry about that, but I'd like you to read the article. It's a really interesting one because it only came out last week. Um, and then I want you to answer these four questions that I have here on the slide. Now, this article is about how after this COVID-19 lockdown, how London is going to change. And one of the big changes that's going to be happening or is at the moment planned to be happening is that they're gonna try and make some of the streets in central London, not everywhere, but some of the streets in central London to be car free. Now that doesn't mean vehicle free, there might be buses still and you can still cycle on them, but they're basically saying anybody with a private car or a taxi or anything, they can't go down there. So if you wanna go down that street, either you're gonna walk, you're gonna cycle, or you're gonna take the bus, or maybe you'll take a tube, okay? There are gonna be some obvious major benefits from this, okay? But it is also quite controversial. They're increasing the congestion charge as well. They're saying that it's gonna charge people even more money than they already do. And of course, knowing what's happened with COVID-19, do we want loads and loads of people packing themselves onto busy tube trains? Or is that actually not a good idea? In the past decade, the past 10 years, we've been saying people need to take way more public transport. But if you think about it right now in this unusual, unique moment that we're in, right in the midst of a pandemic where standing really close to somebody is going to potentially spread a disease, actually, people don't want to take public transport. A lot of people are going to want to drive. So these plans, yes, they are in some ways sustainable, but actually, do they go against what we've said in the past? And do they go against what even the government is saying now about let's not be too crowded together? So a really interesting one where I kind of would say there's no right decision. And this is why I want you to give me your opinions, because you've got to make your own minds up about this stuff as things change based on the knowledge, the incredible knowledge that you are learning 
in this course was so, so relevant and so, so applicable. So I'll see you guys for the final couple of lessons of this unit and then we will be doing a small assessment. If you have missed anything, don't forget to go back. If you haven't subscribed, obviously, please subscribe for updates on all of your lessons. Bye guys.